In 2016, I underwent surgery to figure out what was growing on my spine. I had been feeling numbness in my feet and my legs, and they did an MRI and it showed there was a mass at C6. Roughly speaking, that's one of the vertebrae in the back of my neck, of your neck, of anybody's neck. There's six is one of the middle ones. The mass was blocking signals from my brain to the lower part of my body, and that's what was causing the numbness. After a couple of MRIs, doctors became alarmed because that mass was actually growing, and they were concerned. So they scheduled a biopsy, highly invasive, if you will, open spine surgery to find out what it was. The good news is that it wasn't cancer. The bad news is that it was sarcoidosis. This is the Sark Fighter Podcast, living with sarcoidosis and other rare diseases. Here's your host, John Carlin. Hi, I'm John Carlin, and welcome to episode one of the Sark Fighter Podcast. As the title suggests, I am fighting sarcoidosis, but the podcast is not for me, it's for all of us who are suffering from it or touched by it in some way. Anybody who somehow or some way is fighting sarcoidosis. Now, maybe you have a loved one who suffers from it. Maybe you personally are working to find a cure. Maybe you're a researcher, a fundraiser, or maybe you're working on improvements over uh, some of the dreadful medicines that are now used to treat sarcoidosis. I say dreadful because even though they work, the side effects are awful. Uh, Or maybe, of course, you have the disease, illness, disorder itself. It's also possible that you might be suffering from any one of a a multitude of similar diseases, uh, and I say similar in a very broad sense from lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, other autoimmune diseases, because you might be taking the same drugs as sarcoidosis patients and suffering from therefore the same issues day to day. I'm not an expert on any of these disorders or even sarcoidosis. I'm a patient who is fighting the disease, but I'm also a reporter, a journalist. I anchor the news on WSLS 10, that's the NBC station in Roanoke, Virginia. I've been here for the most part since 1987, started my career in broadcasting and radio in 1980, so I've been at it for a long while. Now, when you're a reporter, you're not really an expert on anything, right? Yet every day you're assigned to cover an event or a topic, usually something important, and then present your findings to the public. So you start out from scratch. It's part research, part interviews with experts, you name it, however you can find the information and confirm it, then you report it back to the public. They call it parachuting in. You One day you don't know anything about a story, the next day uh, you're assigned the story, You ramp up from 9 o'clock in the morning, and on the 6 o'clock news, there you are talking about it like you've been studying it your whole life. But that's that's how journalism works. And actually, that's what I want to do here with this podcast. I want to ask informed questions of people who are somehow affected by the disease or the medicines or the fight to beat sarcoidosis. And I also want to talk about fundraisers and the people who are trying to raise awareness. In fact, I'll be working with the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research in Chicago to find some of these people, talk about the Foundation's events, including summits in cities across the United States, uh, and the latest information on treatment. And mostly, just want to talk with those of you who are somehow dealing with the disease, because I want to hear your stories. I think other people want to hear your stories. And I want to provide a platform for you to share your difficulties, your frustrations, and your successes. Because what I hear from people over and over is that they are alone at home. They are dealing with this disease and nobody understands. They don't know anybody else who has it. And it's just difficult to to find someone to talk to or to listen to. So we want to provide that platform. Now, I would like for the Sark Fighter podcast to become uh, a sarcoidosis and autoimmune community, if you will. This is a place where maybe we can gather virtually, uh, at least in the beginning. Who knows? Maybe we'll all get together sometime, but virtually, uh, where we can share uh, a story that, in my experience, 
not everyone understands. So I'd like for the Sark Fighter podcast to become a sarcoidosis community where we gather, share a story that in my experience, not everyone understands. And since I don't feel like I can ask you to share your stories without sharing my own, I want to take a few minutes now and tell you how I got here. First of all, please don't worry. Uh, I am not going to go point by point through my whole life. (laughs) I don't want everybody to say, oh my God, what's this guy going to shut up? Uh, And I don't even know if anybody will ever listen to this. But uh, I want to hit the high spots because I think that the things that have happened to me either can give you some clues to what's possibly going to happen to you or maybe you can say, yeah, man, I've been there and it sucks. Uh, but uh, I do want to kind of show you the spots that demonstrate how the disease progresses, how it fools you, some of the things I did not see coming, um, and man, it knocked me on my butt. Um, And so I will uh, start out with the surgery that I had in January of 2016, which is four years prior to today's recording. By the way, I'm recording this on January 22nd, 2020. So how did I first know that maybe there was something wrong? As you heard me say in the trailer for the Sark Fighter podcast, I went to work one day and I had these odd sensations actually in one foot. It felt like my sock was all balled up, balled up underneath my foot. So uh, it was bad enough that when I got to my desk, I sat down, I took my shoe off and looked and there was my socks were fine. My feet were fine. They just had this feeling like the socks were all balled up underneath my feet. And it was just sort of an odd sensation. It wasn't painful, but it was odd. And then within about two weeks, it was uh, in both feet. And then I started feeling numbness sort of creeping up through my shins and my calves. So I went to my family doctor and he said, ha, huh, sounds like you have a neuropathy. I'd never heard that word before. Uh, so he sent me to a neurologist, and they did a bunch of tests. And I, I don't remember what all they were, uh, but they started, you know, looking for what was causing this sensation. Now, the good news is, is pretty early on, they ruled out things like MS, Lou Gehrig's disease, other things that at the time I knew about and really scared me. Uh, so that made me feel good. And they thought I had something called transverse myelitis, which is kind of inflammation of your spinal cord, um, and that can cause all the things that I had. So they started treating me for that, and they did some MRIs and found this mass on my spinal cord, which they thought was the transverse myelitis. And I don't remember exactly what they were giving me medicine-wise for that, but whatever it was, um, it wasn't working. A follow-up MRI a few months later showed the mass was actually getting larger. And so they said, look, we've we've got to do a biopsy. We've got to figure out what it was because they thought it was a tumor and they they, they really had convinced me that they thought it was cancer. Uh, at that point, I uh, changed doctors and hospitals. The neurologist I had been seeing uh, was a woman. I, I thought she was a great doctor. Um, she and her husband was a doctor, but they were moving to California and she was leaving her practice here in Roanoke, Virginia, where I live. So, uh, but she recommended a friend of hers at Carillion, which is uh, another hospital in town here and and where I am uh, still doing uh, a lot of my uh, work with doctors today. And uh, he was a uh, uh, neurosurgeon, excuse me, he was a neurosurgeon. Uh, And and so I met with a guy, I liked him a lot, and he said, look, we've got to do this. Um, He said, but... You know, I'm talking about it with the other doctors on the staff because, you know, you're up, you're walking around, you're not in any pain. Um, And so we always wonder, do we do uh, an invasive surgery like this uh, on somebody who's otherwise healthy? Because remember, the whole thing behind medicine is do no harm, right? But he said, if this is growing, we really have to find out what it is. So... um, I agreed to do the surgery, and looking back, in a way, I wish I hadn't. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the Sark Fighter podcast. 
You may be wondering, what can I do to help? How can I be a part of the sarcoidosis solution? It's simple. Make a donation to KISS. Kick in to stop sarcoidosis. 100% of the money goes to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Look for a link in the show notes of the Sark Fighter Podcast. Welcome back to the Sark Fighter Podcast. I'm your host, John Carlin, and today I'm sharing my story with you. Before the break, I told you why I opted for a biopsy to see what was going on on my spinal cord. Uh, and so this was basically open spine surgery, if you will, if you're open heart surgery. I think I may be making that term up. I don't know. But basically, they opened up the back of my neck and they were looking at my spinal cord by the time they were done with this. It's what my, my doctor even described as big boy surgery. So uh, what they essentially did was they made a big slice in the back of my neck, about three inches long. They actually cut off or broke off a a piece of bone um, on a vertebrae, vertebra, uh, vertebrae, I guess is the plural. Uh, I think I looked up a diagram of it. It may be the spineous process bone. I don't know. But anyway, they had to remove a piece of bone in order to access it. Uh, That just goes to show you the level of what they had to do to get in there. Um, And so so when I woke up after this surgery, I was in pain. I mean, people talk about grade your pain on 1 to 10. This was an 11. Just like I would turn my neck and it would be this white, hot, searing pain from my neck that would then just shoot through my body. Um, but they did get a small piece of whatever was causing this inflammation on my spinal cord. And I'm one or two days post-surgery trying to learn to walk without pain using a walker out in the hallway of the hospital. And a doctor whom I did not know comes by and says, Oh, are, are you Mr. Carlin? I said, yes. And he said, well, we've got your diagnosis. You have sarcoidosis. And I said, what? And he said, yes, we, we found that you have a non-caseating granuloma. And I'm looking at this guy like, okay, I've never heard of sarcoidosis. I don't know what a non-caseating granuloma was. And this was a clinical type doctor. And he's, I said, what does that mean? He said, it means you have a non-caseating granuloma. I said, okay, is that good or bad? And he said, it just means you have a non-caseating granuloma. Uh, and, and it's a disease called sarcoidosis. And he wasn't very helpful, but he wasn't, also wasn't my doctor. I guess he was just assigned to be the person who told me and he was headed to my room and found me out in the hall. And so right there in the hall, he told me what I had. Uh, and I had no idea what it was. And sarcoidosis, uh, for whatever reason, kind of sounded like a tumor to me. Uh, so a parade of doctors started coming through my room as uh, the days went on. And this would have been, a, been over a period of, I guess, maybe three or four days. And started describing to me what I had. I do remember back then, the main thing I wanted to recover from was the surgery. I, I thought that was the big deal. I had this big hole in the back of my neck, these all these stitches, and and I, it was painful. And I wanted to uh, get back to work, get back in the anchor chair. Uh, but I can remember uh, going back to work after, I don't know, two weeks, and it was painful, tiring, just to hold my head up to look at the teleprompter and read. As I recall, I I went back and I did only the early evening newscasts and not the 11 p.m. newscasts the first week, and then the next week I went back full time. But my whole emphasis then was, you know, the big thing that had happened to me was the surgery, not not the diagnosis. I wasn't thinking initially much about sarcoidosis. And I had a doctor then, uh, really liked this guy, and he said, look, this is, this is something that is controllable. He said, we don't know that we can cure it, but we can certainly control it. 
and in a couple of years it'll probably go away. I didn't know anything about it again, so I believed him, wanted to believe him. I didn't do a lot of research. I know uh, the internet brings so many opinions from so many directions that you can drown in it. My daughter-in-law, when she, when she had my first grandchild and she was pregnant, started Googling around and there was so much parental advice and pregnancy advice, she didn't know which way to turn. And, um, and I kind of took that approach to it. I said, I'm just going to listen to my doctors and, and go forward from there. I didn't want a bunch of other voices going on. So um, I, I believe that that doctor meant and believed what he said. He's since retired. Uh, but I have come to learn that the disease is much worse than what I thought in those weeks after surgery. It's much worse than uh, basically his uh analysis, or at least what he was willing to tell me. And after the break, I'll tell you how I begin my battle with some unexpected sarcoidosis troubles. Welcome back to the Sark Finder podcast. I'm your host, John Carlin. This is episode one. And before I ask other people to tell their story, I'm sharing my own struggle with sarcoidosis. And if you are listening, welcome to the community. I'll be looking for your feedback on this podcast and and of course, future podcasts, I'm hoping to connect with people who've been impacted and are willing to let me talk with them so we can share their stories here, your stories here. And if you like this podcast, do please take a moment to comment, give it a five-star rating on iTunes or whatever else, uh, that, where you ever else you may be listening to it, and uh, help us spread the word. Now back to my story. Uh, I can't really interview myself, but I'm trying to tell you those parts of my story that I would hope other people would share. Uh, Just like you've heard a doctor who treats himself has a fool for a patient, well, I'm trying to edit my own story. And based upon what I've heard from the autoimmune community, yours may be similar. So I'm trying to sort of extract the high points, and I hope I haven't gone on too much with this. But as I began to recover from surgery, I started to realize what was in front of me. Uh, The surgery I recovered from in just a few months, and now four years later, sarcoidosis is still very front and center in my life. So that kind of shows you how I was looking at that wrong. Uh, The doctor said it might be a year or two before we, quote-unquote, beat this thing. And there are several drugs you can take. And as I remember at the time, we talked about methotrexate. Sound familiar? Remicade. Sound familiar? Azathoroprine. Another common drug. Um, At the time, they all sounded like a foreign language, Uh, but now that I've been around the disease for a bit and talked to some other people, yeah, those are the common ones that are out there, and there there are a few more, Uh, and in fact, I think I've taken one or two others, and I can't even remember what they are right now. Maybe if I go look on my chart, I can find them, but um, so uh, he says, let's start out with methotrexate. He said, but you got to stop drinking. I was, you know, drinking. Uh, you know, I'm, I may have a beer on the weekends kind of guy. But he said, yeah, that's not going to work because it's just too much for your liver. Um, and I went back to him after, I don't know, a month of that. And methotrexate made me feel queasy and uncomfortable and just sort of had a general malaise, which it does for a lot of people. And I said, yeah, I don't like this. Let's try, let's try one of the other ones. And I thought I was making, a, you know, there's a whole menu of these. Let's just try something else because it's not going to be hard to beat this thing. So if there's other options, let's let's try another option. Uh, he really recommended the Remicade, which was an IV treatment. And I thought, well, that's invasive. I don't need to go for IVs. And we got this thing. Uh, I think azathoroprine is what he then prescribed. Uh, but then um, he retired. And so I went to the University of Virginia Medical Center, which uh, had a doctor at the time who was uh, very highly thought of in the sarcoidosis community. When I Googled around looking for a doctor in Virginia, he was the one guy who was recommended. I went up to see him and he said, oh yeah, I've got, I've got six or seven patients right now who have neurosarc and what you really need is Remicade. And I can get that approved. It's apparently expensive. Insurance companies don't like to pay for it, but he was able to get it approved. So I started on Remicade. And you know what? That worked. That worked for a long time. Once I got started with the Remicade, I feel like things went pretty well for me. Uh, I'm a bicyclist, a cyclist, if you will, and I'd gotten back on the bike 
and I'll talk more about that because that's actually a, a big part of my life. It's one of the one of the ways that I uh, evaluate how well I'm doing versus the sarcoidosis. I kind of treat it like my uh, health thermometer, if you will, and I have a blog about that, which I'll tell you more about. You can find it in the show notes. But I don't want to I don't want to divert from the central story right now. But the bottom line is is that through a good part of, uh, of 2018, uh, everything was going really, really well for me. Uh, I felt kind of like I had beaten sarcoidosis. I'd go every eight weeks, I would get an IV, uh, and life became fairly normal. Now, I will tell you that I still had significant numbness and tingling, uh, which became much worse after my 2016 surgery. Uh, I never have felt the same since they went in and did the biopsy, and it's uh, it's been significantly worse. But it didn't. Uh, it wasn't really caused by a worsening. It wasn't really caused by a worsening of the sarcoidosis, as near as I can tell, until about mid 2018, and then I started noticing. Mm, I didn't used to have tingling in my fingers. Now I have tingling in my fingers. So I told my doctor here in Roanoke, uh, I'd switched back from UVA because that doctor left. I got a letter one day, and guess what? That doctor was now gone, moved on to another medical center. So I'm back with uh, my rheumatologist in Roanoke who tells me, uh, yeah, uh, we need to do another MRI. Did the MRI. It showed that, the, in fact, uh, the sarcoidosis inflammation on my spinal cord was getting worse. Uh, the good news was is that they could up the dose of the Remicade a little bit, and so that's what was recommended. In the meantime, that's when they start really looking for tracers in your blood that's, uh, that signify issues with your liver, specifically liver enzymes, as I understand it. And sure enough, after a couple of doses of Remicade at the higher uh, levels, I was having trouble with liver enzymes. I didn't feel any different, but the blood test showed that it was going to be a problem. And so doctor said, we got to take you off Remicade. And so they started uh, dosing me down off of the Remicade and, and starting me up on another interim drug. And uh, it was during that time that I had another significant sarcoidosis event. Uh, it's, typically, it's typically called a flare or an attack, and in my case, it was quite bad. At that point in my sarcoidosis journey, I didn't know that there was such a thing as a flare. Uh, no one had ever uh, told me that it could happen. Uh, either you had the disease under control or you didn't, and it did not occur to me that uh, all of a sudden one day it would get worse, but it did. So I went to bed one night and I had a pain in the middle of my back and woke me up in the middle of the night. I would say this pain was somewhere around a seven or eight on a scale of 10, just sort of a dull thud in the, in the middle of my back. Uh, I got up, walked around the bedroom by morning. I could barely maintain my balance. I couldn't walk. Um, my bowels weren't working. Uh, couldn't go to the bathroom, um, and the the pain was just terrible. I had a headache, and there was a major snowstorm. I remember the day. So my son came in his big four-wheel drive pickup truck and picked me up and took me to the doctor, and they admitted me to the hospital, and I wound up being in the hospital for three days. The MRI showed the uh, sarcoid inflammation on my spinal cord, which is normally just right in the back of my neck, was now ranging all the way down into the middle of my back. So I wound up spending three days in the hospital. Uh, they gave me heavy doses of prednisone via IV and then uh, started me on 80 milligrams of prednisone every day. And if you've never been on 80 grams of prednisone every day, let me tell you, it's not pleasant. Uh, it makes you cranky. It causes all kinds of side effects, which we can talk about. In fact, I plan to do a whole podcast just on dealing with prednisone because that's the first thing 
that they give you when you when you have some sort of a flare up or when you are diagnosed and so now I'm starting on my second at this point starting on my second round with prednisone and that would last a whole year and I'll get into that but man it was not good but it did reduce the inflammation it reduced the pain I got my balance back I got control of my bowels urinary tract back <laughs> it's kind of kind of odd to talk about that but I, I just want the reality of it out there um, the uh, uh, numbness however in my body got worse and it stayed worse that never recovered so basically what the doctors are telling me happens is is once you damage something in your spinal cord and the inflammation can certainly do that that doesn't come back uh, I keep hearing things like well your body will your nervous system will find another way around those blockages okay great but so far that hasn't happened so uh, before the flare uh, I had a certain amount of numbness from my chest down to my feet, but it did not include my arms. Now it includes my arms and basically my ring and pinky fingers on both hands. Uh, not my middle finger, not my thumb, not my index finger. I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop at some point in the future, but so far so good. I have the function of those things, but you can't you just can't feel things when you uh, when you go to pick something up and you've got this uh, this kind of terrible pins and needles feeling all the time that never goes away I take a drug called gabapentin which helps with that uh, but it's not it's certainly not a cure and it certainly doesn't make it go away completely it just makes it so you so you can kind of live with it and I'm taking 600 milligrams of gabapentin four times a day so you know, great. Luckily, that doesn't have any side effects, and that's that's all that. All right. It, while all of this was actually prior to this flare-up, I had kind of said to myself, you know, this this disease is not going away. I'm not going to have the two-year cure, and I kind of thought that I really had it under control when the Remicade was working, but I had started thinking I needed to find people who really specialized in sarcoidosis and I started googling around and started contacting medical centers that had known uh, sarcoidosis uh, centers and people who really they just weren't doctors who handled sarcoid patients along with all their other patients these were doctors that handled only sarcoidosis patients or mostly sarcoidosis patients and I thought I'm willing to drive to make sure that I have this under control. So I'd reached out to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore and also to the Cleveland Clinic. Baltimore from my house is about four hours away. The Cleveland Clinic is seven hours, give or take. And I just kind of wanted to see what was out there. And when one of my doctors here locally had recommended uh, the, uh, the Johns Hopkins people. So I reached out to both of them and I got to say that the Cleveland Clinic just got back to me much sooner. Uh, they seem to have a better uh, system for reaching out to patients or potential patients, and they were just really good about it, and they were able to get me in to see somebody sooner than Johns Hopkins. So based upon that little bit of information, since online they both seemed like outstanding opportunities, I went ahead and, uh, and scheduled with the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, I can't say that I'm, um, you know, glad that I did versus Johns Hopkins because I have no idea what J the Johns Hopkins experience might have been like. And I'm sure it would have been great. But um, I have been thrilled with the Cleveland Clinic folks. So uh, starting in January of 2019, which is a year ago as I speak right now, uh, right almost down to the day, um, I started dealing with two doctors in Cleveland, in addition to my rheumatologist at Carillion here in Roanoke. And nothing against that doctor. Uh, it was just a matter of I wanted to go someplace that specialized in sarcoidosis and uh, might develop a protocol uh, based upon just seeing more people with what I had and also maybe the opportunity for clinical trials and that kind of thing. So that's, that's how I wound up in Cleveland. So as I recovered from the, uh, the flare-up that happened in December of 2018, I went for my initial consult in Cleveland. My wife and I drove up, uh, spent the night, met with the doctors, 
and waited for them to tell me what they thought would be best for me. Once again, uh, I have a neurologist there, looked at my scans, and he said he couldn't believe I was walking. Yeah, he was not the first physician, uh, neurologist, to tell me that. When they look at what's going on in my spinal cord, uh, they say it, it looks much worse than I present in person. They said they have seen people with uh, less of a inflammation on their spinal cord who are in much worse shape. So um, I just thank my lucky stars that I am where I am. And then uh, I also have most of the doctors at the Cleveland Clinic are pulmonologists because most times sarcoidosis presents in the lungs. I, I want to say 70 or 75 percent. I'm just doing that off the top of my head based upon what I've read. Uh, and we'll be talking to doctors on the Sark Fighter podcast about that. But these doctors came up with a plan for me, and it would pretty much make 2019 the hardest year of my adult life. The doctors in Cleveland recommended that I go with a treatment of cytoxin. Uh, there's a longer word for that, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. But basically, cytoxin is a chemotherapy drug, and it can have uh, side effects like you would see with cancer patients. Uh, so uh, they continue to keep me on the prednisone while I then started going every three to four weeks, depending upon where in the year I was, for treatments with cytoxin. And this is no picnic. Uh, so now I'm dealing with the side effects from the chemo. I'm dealing with the uh, prednisone, and I was not easy to live with. Let me just let me just put it that way. I would get a cytoxin treatment on a Friday, and I would start feeling pretty lousy by the end of the day. It seemed like it got worse as the day went on, and then uh, the following Saturday and Sunday. I spent a lot of time on the couch. Um, there were some days when, when I was able to get out, um, but uh, I would just have really bad brain fog. I wouldn't have any energy. I couldn't point to any place on my body and say, well, this is what hurts. I would have slight nausea, although they gave me some medicine for that, and that, that seemed to help. Um, but it was, it was just bad, and I found myself just being more and more lethargic. I was able to work through most of this, uh, we did go on some, I uh, went on the most amazing vacation of my life. We did a, um, we did an African safari and that was awesome. And I loved it because they drove you around and you stayed, the rules were you stayed in these vehicles and I've, you know, fancy myself to be a pretty good amateur photographer. I've got a, a nice Canon camera and a, and a couple of long lenses and, and I just got some amazing photos, um, uh, but it was, uh, it was great because I didn't have to walk anywhere. I didn't have to do anything. And if anybody who knows me knows that that is not me. I'm a hiker. Uh, I'm a cyclist. I have a cycling blog. And I'll be talking more about cycling and sarcoidosis. I have, in fact, I have a whole series of blogs dedicated just to that. And once again, I'll put a link in the show notes. But uh, I ride my bike three or four times a week uh, in the summer. Uh, in the evenings, and yeah, I ride pretty aggressively. We live in the mountains of southwestern Virginia, and you know when you ride around here, you're typically riding up a pretty good mountain. And on an easy day, you're kind of going up and down through what you might call hilly terrain, uh, rolling hills type of things. But usually, you know, we'll if you ride on the Blue Ridge Parkway, which is right here in town, you can't ride very far before you're you know climbing for you know, between five and 10 minutes before you get to the top of a mountain. And there's one mountain next to my house that uh, it's a, a half hour, 45 minute climb for me. So you're just going uphill the whole way, we're talking, you know, five to seven miles uphill. Uh, and that's, that was my life. And then, uh, then all of a sudden I'm hit with this chemo slash prednisone year and I'm down on the local greenway, which parallels the river, and it's nice and flat, relatively speaking. I mean, really flat. Uh, and that's all I'm able to ride all year. Uh, and, and I'll continue to talk about that. But that's, 
uh, the computers, the GPS that you have on a, on a nice bicycle anymore that you can buy and add really to any bicycle. Um, it's just like a, you know, a Fitbit or an Apple watch or, you know, whatever, except it's really designed for cycling. And, um, so you know how hard your effort was when you went out. And for me, an average day on the flats prior to, 2019, I would have been looking at averaging, say, 16 to 17 miles an hour on a flat course. By mid-July, it took all of my energy to average 11 miles an hour. And there was just nothing more in there. There was nothing else in the tank. There was nothing more I could do. Um, I still enjoyed being out there on my bicycle. It wasn't like I was fighting it the whole time. I just could not go any faster. I did not have any strength. And, and my brain was just completely clouded. Uh, I ride a lot with my wife, who's also an avid cyclist. Uh, during normal times, you know, I'm the one out front. Uh, I'm what they, in bicycling, if you're not familiar with it, they call it pulling. Think of it like drafting uh, in a race car, you know, behind the guy in front of you. He's sort of, you know, knocking down the wind, and then you're just riding in his draft. And so that's really important on a bicycle. So normally I would be pulling and Mary would be drafting. Uh, this summer, it was just the reverse. She would be out front, and I'd have to ask her to slow down. I couldn't keep up. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying, you know, feel sorry for me or anything like that. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm painting a realistic picture of what these drugs were doing to my body. And I felt like I was suffering a lot more from the drugs than I was from the, um, you know, from the sarcoidosis itself. But the bottom line is, is that when you've got it on your spinal cord, if you have a flare, as I learned back in December of 2019, when you have a flare, the damage is done and it doesn't get undone. You know, the part that's, that's uh, in your uh, nervous system, the spinal cord doesn't repair itself. So uh, I cannot afford to have a flare. At any rate, uh, I went through 2019 dealing with the, uh, the chemo treatments, uh, occasional uh, MRIs to track the treatments, and with the prednisone being slowly reduced throughout the course of the year. They'd take me down about 10 milligrams a month, give or take. Uh, the idea was every time I had a chemo treatment, I could go down another 10 milligrams to the point where now a year later, uh, I'm almost completely off prednisone. I'm taking two and a half milligrams every day, and I want to get off of that. But the good news is, is that... Um, the chemo went as far as they thought it would go. Uh, it did not reduce the inflammation images completely in my MRIs, but uh, it, it did work. And uh, after a while, they said, all right, we are going to get you off of these drugs that are doing so much damage to your daily life. And they prescribed Humira. You've probably heard of that drug. They advertise it on, on television. You'll see it, say, on the Today Show. And it's been used for various autoimmune or, or autoinflammatory uh, diseases. And the doctors thought that would be the best path forward for me. So let me describe to you my journey now with Humira over the last, I want to say, three to four months. Humira has been, so far for me, a godsend. Uh, I have not had any side effects from it. i uh, been able to, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, uh, almost completely get off of prednisone, and I anticipate that I, I will be off of it. I've been able to lose uh, a lot of the weight. Uh, my television viewers are writing me nice notes saying, oh, you're starting to look like the old John again because I don't have this big puffy face. Um, my um, belly is still not where I want it. I gained about 20 pounds during 2019 with all of these drugs, and I've been able to lose 10 and I was, you know, I really wanted to lose more than that because my son just got married in a beautiful ceremony at Disney, and I was the officiant, which was really heartwarming. And maybe some point I'll even link to the video on that. But I wanted, I wanted to look better for, uh, you know, for the pictures and so forth. So I, I went pretty hard uh, with an Atkins type of diet in order to uh, to lose some weight. The, the bottom line is, is that. Uh, once I stopped taking prednisone, uh, 
for the most part, I was able to lose the weight and then I've lost 10 pounds and I, and I want to lose the, uh, the other 10. And I'm kind of working towards that right now. Uh, but that's, that's been the, the, the good thing about Humira. I did have some trouble um, initially working through the insurance company and all of that, even though it was finally approved and the doctors had to really lay out a strong case for it. Uh, they got it approved, and then there was some back and forth. Uh, the the doctor wanted me to take a, a bolus dose, which is a like a large startup dose, and then uh, and then sort of a maintenance dose after that. But we finally got that worked out, and so now what I do is they give you a self injection pen, which is really easy to do, and you basically once a week you take that pen and you. Um, you stick it in, <laughs> in some belly fat or in your thigh and you press the go button and 10 seconds later you've given yourself a shot at Humira and you're good for the week and then uh, we just go forward and uh, they send me uh, new uh, doses of Humira which you keep in the refrigerator um, every uh, couple of three weeks and so I've always got some on hand. Um, it is expensive and the insurance company uh, really, you know, wants a strong case for it. Uh, I can tell that they uh, don't they don't like paying for it, but uh, but they have, and it's been it's been good so far. So that's been my uh, my case with Humira. Uh, I'm not going to go on and on about any of the other things uh, from 2019, uh, other than to say that it was just really a difficult difficult year. Um, and I will be really glad to have 2019 in my rearview mirror. So that's my story. That's where I am sitting here right now today, and uh, it's been a journey. The, th- the thing, my takeaways from this are that, uh, you know, I've got a friend with cancer. It's nowhere near as bad as what he's gone through, but it certainly has upended my life as I know it. It certainly has made it difficult to be the active, outdoorsy person that I like to be, uh, to the point where, you know, even like mowing the lawn can be you know, extremely difficult. I can remember making one or two passes and having to lean over and catch my breath, and then make another couple of passes and lean over and catch my breath. It changes your daily life. It makes it so you are no longer living the life that you are used to living or that you want to live. And this is especially hard for me, I would say, because I've always been an active, healthy, somewhat athletic person. And that was kind of how I live my life. That's what my life's activities revolved around. So I've had to sort of adopt my new normal. And I will tell you that when the Remicade was working in 2017 and 2018, uh, I wasn't as good as I once was, like the country song says, uh, but I was living a life and I had adopted my new normal and I was pretty good with that. I'd accepted it and kind of reached equilibrium with it until that flare-up in December of, uh, of 2018. And then everything got worse. And now I am just very gun shy. Like, oh my God, I don't want that to happen again. I don't want to have to live with that again. So what are we going to do here? Well, one of the things that happened in 2019 when I was on the air and I was telling and I was um, taking the prednisone is that the news director came to me and said, look, do you mind if we explain to viewers what's going on with you? And I said, no, let's do it. So I told my story uh, in a uh, in a long-form piece on television. My co-anchor interviewed me. They came out and took some pictures of me, a video of me riding my bike and so forth. And we put the story on the air. We put it on the Internet. And the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research found it, and then they redistributed it through some of their social media and email. And I started hearing from people all over the country who said, John, this is, you know, this is exactly what I'm dealing with, or this is some version of what I'm dealing with. And I feel like I'm dealing with it all by myself. I feel like I'm all alone with sarcoidosis. Nobody understands. Nobody gets it. It's completely ruined my life. um, And I just don't hear anybody talking about it. And I felt like, well, wow. 
uh, I was I was really humbled by it because people were so happy that that someone was talking about it. So I said, well, you know what what can I do to help? What how how can I keep this going forward? How can I help the sarcoidosis community at large? Um, kind of kind of deal with this disease because nobody you know when I say nobody I don't mean not a single person but there's certainly not widespread activity uh, on social media or anywhere else with people talking about this so here's my plan my plan is to have this podcast go forward Uh, I am working with the foundation for sarcoidosis research they are finding me experts uh, I want to become somewhat of a, uh, a brand advocate or brand, an- I guess they used to use the term ambassador and the term that the foundation is using now is advocate. And I want to, uh, I want to give that a shot here in the year 2020 and see how far it goes, see what kind of response there is, see what kind of interest there is in this. Uh, so I'll be interviewing uh, people who are willing to share their story as I've shared mine. Uh, I want to talk to researchers. I want to uh, try and put in layman's terms, which is kind of what we do on TV news all the time. We'll go interview an expert, and then we have to represent that on the evening news in a way that you know all of our audience can understand it um, and can be interested in it because you know you have to have interesting storytelling, or nobody is going to care. Uh, so to the extent that we can accomplish that here on the Sark Fighter podcast, I want to do that. I want to, uh, I want you to read my blog about bicycling. Um, if that's something that interests you, if, if you're an active person, you know, for you, it might be hiking, it might be running, it might be working out at the Y, uh, you know, you know, whatever it is, but if you have sarcoidosis, all of those things are impacted and maybe some of what I'm learning and writing about with my, uh, cycling blog will uh, will resonate with you. Um, I you know I am uh, pushing 60 years old, and so I've certainly dialed back my cycling even without being uh, you know, somebody with sarcoidosis. Uh, but um, that doesn't mean that I don't ride my bike and enjoy riding my bike. But some of the places that I've ridden because I can't go uphill, so I started driving to places that are flat or rail trails or uh, or, or maybe even paved trails that are, are not terribly difficult. The one that comes to mind is the Capitol Trail in Virginia that goes from Richmond to uh, Yorktown uh, over near Williamsburg. So that's uh, right there in, the, in, the, in, in, in a part of Virginia that doesn't have many hills. Um, and it's paved and it's beautiful. And there's, it's 50 miles long, and they actually do a ride. I've never done the whole ride, but they do a uh, what they call a century ride where you ride 100 miles. You ride 50 miles down and 50 miles back. Uh, and people, you know, so it's, it's just full of people on their bicycles. But m- my wife and I have gotten to the point where we'll get in the car, drive three hours to Richmond, and then go ride, say, 15 miles out on the trail and 15 miles back for a 30-mile ride, which isn't terrible. And then we'll get a nice dinner. We'll spend the night in Richmond, maybe do some shopping, get breakfast, and then drive back to our home in, in Roanoke, Virginia. Um, so that's that'll be one of the things that I'll be covering. I want to talk to people in the sarcoidosis space and help the people who are raising money to fight the disease because one of the things that uh, the, the folks at the foundation have found is that you know, Big Pharma is not working, by and large, on cures or remedies for these various uh, inflammations because there's not enough people who suffer from it and therefore there's not enough demand for the drug and it takes them years and years of research it's very expensive on their end and it's a a risk reward scenario i get it Uh, so if they're working on drugs for cancer or pick one, rheumatoid arthritis, things that more people have, then there's going to be more people who want to take the drug and they can they can make more money. Uh, we do live in a capitalistic society and, and I support that. So I understand it. But uh, the more people who are talking about sarcoidosis and the more people who understand it, the, uh, the greater the awareness level will be. And I think therefore, ipso facto, the more folks uh, in, in big pharma and research 
may be driven to find some remedies that go beyond the, the terrible drugs that I was taking in 2019 that made my life so miserable, and I'm sure your life miserable, and, and based upon what I've heard from people, way more miserable than, than my situation. One of the things I want to do, whether I interview people or maybe just share their stories, is I want to share some letters and emails. And you can email me at a link that will be in the show notes. It's carlinagency at gmail.com. Just put sarcoidosis in the, uh, in the line for the, for the subject. But after I went on the air, I heard from a lot of people. And a guy named George Pearson sent me a letter, and he sent me a t-shirt. And I'll describe the t-shirt here in just a moment. It's black, it's got white letters, and it says sarcoid on the front and on the back. It says fighting for function. Here's what he said. It's a very short letter. He said, I was diagnosed with sarcoidosis at Duke Medical Center in January of 1970. 47 years later, I was diagnosed with neurosarcoidosis at Johns Hopkins Hospital. My wonderful doctor is Dr. Barney Stern, and that's a name, folks, that I have heard uh, mentioned quite a lot. But George continues, during my last visit in April of 2019, I asked Dr. Stern about my prognosis. He said, we are trying to maintain function. I said, fighting for function. That sounds like a t-shirt. Now the t-shirt is real. As you wear your shirt, I hope it causes people to ask questions. When they do, if you have the time, please share a few words about sarcoid. Thank you for wearing your shirt. George Pearson, fighting for function. And that was one of the things that made me decide I wanted to do this podcast. He wants people to talk about it. I want people to talk about it. I want people to understand when I say I have sarcoidosis, I don't want to have to then... Uh, launch into a whole description of what it is. I'd, I'd like for, for more people to know about it. So that's one of the reasons we're doing this podcast. I want to share that I've been working behind the scenes with uh, our local medical center here in Roanoke, Virginia, Carillion, uh, which is just growing by leaps and bounds, and, and they do are doing a phenomenal job. There's a new medical school uh, associated with Virginia Tech here in town, um, and, you know, I could, I could definitely see Carillion becoming uh, way more focused on sarcoid, sarcoidosis in the future. Um, you know, I mean, I, they certainly have the wherewithal. I'm not, I'm not speaking on behalf of the hospital, but uh, they certainly would have the wherewithal to do that. But I've been working with them, and we are going to have a sarcoidosis awareness event. It'll be on Tuesday, April 21st, 2020, at the Grandin Theater from 5.30 to 7 p.m. It is uh, open, free to the public, and Carillion will be uh, handling some uh, registration and refreshments and so forth, and we will be uh, talking about sarcoidosis. There will be a Q&A. Uh, I'll be uh, speaking a little bit myself. Uh, Dr. Bancoli, who happens to be my doctor, will be talking about the latest research. And then mostly the idea is for people who are suffering from this disease in one way or another, um, have an opportunity to talk about it and to commiserate with one another. And my hope is that out of this event, we gather enough momentum that there becomes a local support group here in southwestern Virginia. So that would be, that would be my hope. We have to see if the interest is there. Uh, I think we certainly uh, have the uh, Carillion is interested in, in helping to make that happen. Um, but I want to have it be um, I want to have it be real. I want to have folks have the opportunity to get together. Uh, I want to have programs and an agenda. Uh, and I don't want it to be people sitting around a card table in the church basement. That might be helpful, but I'd like to have something that, that is uh, even better than that. A couple of other notes on the calendar. Don't forget that April is Sarcoidosis Awareness Month, and there will be a whole host of activities being put out there then. We'll talk more about that as it gets closer. There is something called the Team KISS 5K. Again, KISS stands for Kick In to Stop Sarcoidosis. That'll be in San Diego on April 18th. Man, I love the weather in San Diego. Uh, and the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is having three summits this year. They'll have one in Chicago from April 
3 through 5 in Miami, June 26th through the 28th, and in Portland, Oregon, September 11th through the 13th, all of those dates in 2020. Uh, And we'll be looking at some of those events uh, in a little bit more detail in upcoming editions of the Sark Fighter podcast. If you want to know how you can help right now, I've created a KISS account with the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. There will be a link to that in the show notes, and you can just click on that and make a donation, and 100% of that money goes directly to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. And I would encourage you to check out their website, which will also be in the show notes. There's lots of great information in there about the latest research and things that are moving forward. That's all for this edition of the Sark Fighter Podcast. Thank you for listening. If you like it, please give it a five-star rating. Make sure you subscribe, share it as much as you can. Help me get the word out there. And I'll talk to you in the next edition of the Sark Fighter Podcast.